Okay. So this morning, um, for those of you who weren't here or those of you who've just wandered back from lunch, this morning, of course, we heard about the international experience, comparing, contrasting Australia with what happens in other parts of the world, how other countries have grappled with the idea of integrating Indigenous political governance within their own political structures, with some specific reference then as well to Canada and New Zealand. We heard about the impact of treaties in North America, uh, in New Zealand, the role of the uh, of reserved seats in New Zealand, and some of the, the ongoing challenges too of, of, uh, of maintaining those treaties and maintaining the, um, the efficacy of those treaties. Now we're going to turn to the question of how First Nations people in the USA and Scandinavia fit into these legal structures and governance of their countries. Uh, the first speaker is Dali Sambodoro, the Professor, Department of Political Science, University of Alaska. Thank you. First of all, um, as I said earlier, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this uh, unceded uh, territory, as well as um, those of all other Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders across this, this whole nation, as well as Indigenous peoples elsewhere. Um, I thought that I had 20 minutes. It's been trimmed down, or I was in error, and I have 15 minutes, so I'm going to fly through and probably cut out uh, bits and pieces here. But I think what's important to say at the outset is that what I have to say is really not important. What I th Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have to say about this entire question is what is important. They are the self in self-determination. Indigenous peoples have understood the concepts of sovereignty and self-determination, and though we didn't have words to express them, we understood what it meant to uh, live by our various different values and customs and practices and institutions and by our own uh, cultural protocol. We had highly sophisticated forms of social control. Uh, there's no question. You can speak to any any indigenous person and they know their place in their society and they know quite a lot about this uh, sophisticated form of social control. Much of this is embedded in our languages and our, again, uh, protocols, customs, and practices. We have also understood forever that all of these things are interrelated, interdependent, indivisible, and interconnected. I kind of chuckle to myself when we hear the United Nations and representatives there talk about sustainable development goals. Look, look at indigenous peoples and, and the concept of sustainable. We, we are the living evidence of sustainable development, yet at the same time they have tried to push us out of this discussion by not directly and specifically acknowledging indigenous peoples, but the attempts uh, to lump us into vulnerable groups. Certainly we're vulnerable, but here it's disrespectful not to refer to us specifically as indigenous peoples. I'm going to uh, jump across huge chunks of history to try to uh, make the points that I have here as far as the situation in the United States. I'll try to focus more uh, specifically on the situation in Alaska, but then across the, the circumpolar Arctic. I am an Inuk woman. Uh, my people are Inuit uh, from the Russian Far East, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. So I'd like to give you a bit of a glimpse as to our experience in the Arctic region. In the United States, uh, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution reads, the Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. We heard uh, reference to uh, Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution earlier. Well, this is language within the United States Constitution that allows a pathway toward uh, engagement with Indian people. But we know, all of us in the room, acutely aware of the colonial history of the United States, the Indian Wars, as was mentioned earlier, and also the fabrication of legal doctrines to legitimize the taking of land and to entrench superiority 
in all of the subsequent policies uh, that have been handed down uh, through the decades uh, within the United States. The era, uh, or the subsequent policies of the era of treaties, uh, the Marshall Trilogy of Cases, which did have their pros in terms of uh, recognition and an affirmation of the sovereignty of Indian tribes, the validity of treaties, the land boundaries that were legally legitimate, um, the uh, reference to uh, domestic dependent nations, uh, which again sets apart indigenous peoples. Uh, there were a number of other things that emerged from this Marshall Trilogy of Cases, all of which I can't go into right now. But uh, again, this was, this was uh, a part and parcel of the development of the various different legal doctrines that would subsequently begin to further regulate Indian people, indigenous peoples in the United States. We also had the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934, which was amended in 1936 to apply to Alaska Native people, meaning um, the opportunity for some tribes to organize themselves as traditional councils or as tribal governments. I'll say a little bit more about that later. Later, we also had Public Law 280, um, which uh, is shorthand for a, a, a law that essentially um, prompted rapid assimilation uh, that was put in place in 1953 and has had uh, various different consequences for Indian people. In Alaska, it essentially handed over civil and criminal jurisdiction over all Alaska Native people. There are elements of Public Law 280 that are actually much more constructive and useful, but in my view, because of the lack and, and of um, recognition of and respect for the rights of Alaska Native tribes, the state of Alaska has chosen not to trigger any of those useful provisions that would allow for full faith and credit, for example, between uh, the, the state courts and uh, the tribal courts that have emerged since that time. In addition, we've had the policy of termination and relocation. Uh, we've also had the policy, uh, surprisingly, under President Nixon, of the Indian Self-Determination and Education Act. Um, but essentially, all of these various different policies have been imposed upon uh, Indian people throughout the United States, including Alaska Natives, and certainly not uh, done in a way that um, uh, was in partnership, uh, especially in the way that we're talking about the opportunity for reorienting um, and reconceptualizing the relationship between the Australian government and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders here. Uh, essentially, I think it has resulted in just a series of policies that allow for the prescriptive regulation of Indian tribes, nations, and peoples throughout uh, the United States, including Alaska. And the, these um, impacts of the policies, but colonialism overall has resulted in massive loss of lands, territories, and resources. If one were simply just to look up on Google the, uh, the Indian territory uh, prior to contact in contrast to uh, the small checkerboard bits and bobs of land across the United States, one can see that we are talking about massive land loss. It's also contributed to poverty, uh, to uh, devastating socioeconomic conditions, um, issues related to water, sanitation, energy, environment, resource development, a, a whole range of things. Um, you should know that in the United States, uh, there are 567 federally recognized tribes. Well, if anyone were to study the right to self-determination and understand that the right to self-identification is an essential element, you could see that there would be a problem with federally recognized Indian tribes. I, I don't have the time to go into just a lecture alone on that particular issue, but um, of those so-called federally recognized Indian tribes, 229 of them are in Alaska. So quite a large number of them, and they range from uh, size to 100 or less to um, you know, four, five, 6,000 individuals. 
The Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs in the United States, and stunningly an Inupiat woman from uh, Barrow, Alaska, or now referred to as Utqiagvik, Alaska, just last week was confirmed as the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs in the Trump administration, Tara Sweeney. The Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs um, publishes a list of the so-called federally recognized Indian tribes. I'll just uh, offer the personal note that my husband is enrolled to a tribe that is recognized by the state of North Carolina, but not recognized by the federal government. So I have access to health care, but he does not. Just one small uh, footnote that uh, gives you a little bit of a glimpse as to the impacts of um, federally recognized Indian tribes. But the Assistant Secretary, in the preambular language of this listing of federally recognized Indian tribes, states, the listed Indian entities are acknowledged to have the immunities and privileges available to federal recognized Indian tribes by virtue of their government-to-government -government relationship with the United States, as well as the responsibilities, powers, limitations, and obligations of such tribes. And that language may um, seem pretty broad, but uh, it takes close inspection as to uh, what powers they actually have, the extent of their jurisdiction. Um, certainly in the case of Alaska, I'm sure that we'll hear from Terry about uh, how it's operationalized for Indian tribes in other parts of the United States. Um, so they have the power to determine their own governance structures, the power to pass laws, to enforce laws through tribal police and tribal courts. Uh, they can engage in direct contracting to provide health care and social programs, education, workforce development, energy and land management, building and maintenance of infrastructure, including roads, bridges, uh, public buildings, housing, etc. So the present capacity of tribal governments in the United States is fairly extensive in terms of looking after some of the basic day-to-day -day needs of uh, their membership, uh, whether it is on reservation land or off-reservation land. The opportunity to have constructive relations with states is also afforded. I mentioned full faith and credit between, uh, for example, tribal courts and a state court. Likewise, for tribal policing, uh, having a, a, a collaborative relationship with adjacent uh, state lands, um, some tribes enjoy this. Uh, the Navajo Nation is probably one of the most developed in this regard as far as um, full faith and credit and uh, cross-deputization of uh, uh, police forces and so forth. Um, in Alaska, though, we had a very, very different uh, history. And in large part, I mean, it goes all the way back to the Treaty of Session of 1867, but as I mentioned earlier, the amendment of the Indian Reorganization Act in 1936 to apply to Alaska Native tribes. And my mention of this is to underscore the fact that traditional councils and tribal governments were in place uh, uh, as in the same way as uh, I, I mentioned social control and our various different customs and practices and institutions um, that predated uh, the Treaty of Session that actually predate the Indian Reorganization Act. But nevertheless, it was afforded under federal law for tribes in Alaska to organize themselves under the IRA Act. Uh, statehood um, threw a big monkey wrench into things as far as our relations and really crystallizing the government-to-government -government relationship that is enjoyed by many other tribes in the, what we refer to as the, as the lower 48. Uh, so the Statehood Act was problematic for us as Alaska Native people, but even more problematic was the 1968 discovery of oil on the north slope of Alaska. And where there's oil, there's darkness, <laughs> in terms of the dark side of, of development. Uh, and this triggered um, a, a, a debate as to, well, there was a, a, a prior debate, excuse me, a prior debate about land ownership and title to land. The Inupiat of the North Slope screamed trespass, that the oil industry was trespassing on their land. All of this, the short story is, all of this led to, well, if we had threatened litigation, 
uh, we had a strong legal leg to stand on. We hadn't ceded territory, we hadn't signed a treaty, we hadn't uh, entered into armed conflict uh, with the uh, settlers. Uh, we had a pretty strong legal case. Industry, the state government, and the federal government, in my view, recognized that they had uh, no legal leg to stand on in terms of the aboriginal right and title, especially of the Inupiat of the North Slope, where that oil happened to be. And it is not a coincidence that discovery of a resource or need for an extractive industry prompts land claims agreements. Um, we have seen that across the North and elsewhere. Um, so what ended up happening was uh, a unilateral act of Congress. The Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act of 1971 was signed into law by President Nixon. And it was thought that reservations uh, were something for the lower 48, that we, all the negative connotations of, of a reservation were not wanted uh, in Alaska. But I think it was a little more devious and nefarious than that, uh, meaning that others at hand always wanted to ensure that they could access the resources of Alaska. The corporate structure uh, that was created by this um, land claims settlement, and I say settlement, not agreement, a land claim settlement as though it's done, period, over, it's been settled, um, put into place uh, the a corporate structure, corporate framework. Uh, it had a lot of very complex, even though it was a short piece of legislation, probably only 18 pages or so, it had a, a complex series of um, uh, provisions related to it. Am I really out of time? Oh my gosh, okay, all right. Well, I didn't even get a chance to talk about the comprehensive land claims agreements in Canada as a comparative uh, analysis to the situation in Alaska. Hopefully in, uh, in the round of um, possible questions, I can illuminate the important elements of um, of those comprehensive land claims agreements because they are uh, dramatically different and may be instructive and useful for the conditions here in terms of an agreement in principle, a negotiated, um, an, a, a negotiated agreement, as well as um, uh, elements like a referendum. So the substantive and the procedural aspects are, are dramatically different, and I'm sorry I ate into your time, fellow panelists. Yeah. Mm. member of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. Good afternoon, everyone. Everybody doing okay? Yeah? Good, good. Um, I want to acknowledge, uh, I hope that I pronounced this correctly, uh, Nambri, the Nambri and the Nunawal. Yes, thank you. And our host, the ANU, uh, for, for the invitation to participate in this important conference. I will be speaking to you today from my experience as governance. Um, I've served my nation as a Secretary of State, and I was elected to serve on our tribal council and was honored to be selected by my council um, as the first woman to chair the tribal council. Um, that was in our whole history. So, um, and then I just wanted to just kind of to reiterate what Daly had said. It is impossible to talk about um, the legal structure and the governance of, of American Indians, Alaska Natives, in the course of 15 minutes. Um, typically that takes at least a semester and some extra classes. Um, so um, anyway, uh, Daly, I think, had set up uh, really well the, uh, the, the foundational pieces, which is the uh, Commerce Clause um, that the um, let me just start. In the U.S., the First Nations and their governments predate the United States Constitutions. The First Nations uh, are the first sovereigns of the land. The United States Constitution added itself as the second sovereign and the states the third sovereign. Um, after the Revolutionary War, the new nation we know as the United States of America was settling into its governing structure that is framed in the U.S. Constitution. American Indians were written into the document in three places the apportionment clause, which was using population as the basis of apportioning the seats of the House of Representatives, and the tax liability among the states, excluding Indians not taxed, 
and maybe there's a legal scholar here who can tell me when they decided to tax Indians because I pay income tax and that, that hasn't been excluded from the Constitution. Just saying. Um, the Indian Commerce Clause that Daly had mentioned, uh, Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. And the treaty-making powers of the President, which is, of course, uh, subject to the advice and consent of the Senate. Over the 242 years the United, of United States existence, the body of law that provides the legal framework for Indians and Indian Nation is called Federal Indian Law. The context within First Nations people and their governments exists as the federal law. The U.S. government recognizes that First Nations are uh, pre-existing sovereigns. In these three provisions the, of the U.S. Constitution, the federal government retains its authority in dealing with, with Indians. However, in more recent years, some federal laws require that tribes and states negotiate over certain issues like gaming, um, alcohol, um, things like that. So the U.S. continued the British policy of treaty making until 1873 when Congress ended the treaty making period. The nature of the pol relationship of uh, Indian nations and the U.S. government is a political relationship, nation to nation. It's not a relationship that is based on race. And I just want to say to you all that um, one of the things that I was reacting to in the pre-conference doc pre documents was the issue of the talk about race. And as I've sat here in the, uh, uh, the pre-session we had yesterday and then today, last night and today, I now understand why the race, why, why this conversation is kind of starting in the race, with the race issue. But my hope is that, um, that, the, uh, I'll, that, the, uh, that you all will come to some agreement about moving that, shifting that over to a political-based relationship. Uh, because I think that that is the proper way to begin this conversation. There are many federal statutes and case law that forge our federal law system, and I want to highlight a couple of the statutes uh, that point to indigenous governments within the in, uh, legal structure of the U.S. One was the Indian Civil uh, Citizenship Act that was passed in 1924, which granted full U.S. citizenship to indigenous peoples of the United States. We didn't ask for that. They just did it, and they didn't ask us. They just did it. I have a little anecdotal story that I want to share with you. Um, I do a lot of work in addressing violence against women and was involved in the passage of the Violence Against Women Act in the United States since 2000. Um, one, of the, one of the stories that was shared with me was that when uh, the, uh, uh, when the, the citizenship bill was being presented, the suffragettes uh, really opposed Indian citizenship. And I was rather appalled by that, uh, but once I found out why, it made perfect sense. The women uh, in the state of New York primarily, which is where the suffragettes were uh, at, uh, understood because they had relations with the indigenous women of the uh, Iroquois, the Six Nations, and they understood that once Indians became citizens within the United States construct, those women would not have the political power that they, sh that they had prior to being citizens of the United States. And so um, it really uh, causes me to think, you know, you have to look twice at history sometime to kind of see uh, what's really being done there. And especially since we, I didn't live that experience, um, that was something that was really important for me to know. Um, and then, of course, um, so moving on there, the Indian Citizenship Act um, was really uh, enacted partially to, uh, as recognition of the thousands of Indians who served in the armed forces during World War I. One of the seminal federal laws passed to address First Nations governments was the Indian Reorganization Act, which Daly had mentioned, and uh, it's federal legislation that deals with the status of uh, Native Americans. Um, the intent was to reverse the assimilationist policies that had resulted in considerable damage to Native American cultures and to provide a, a means for American Indians to reestablish sovereignty and self-government, to reduce the losses of reservation lands, and to build economic self-sufficiency. The act also restored to Indians the management of their assets, land, and mineral rights, and included provisions intended to create a sound economic foundation for the inhabitants of Indian reservations. 
The law did not apply, however, to Hawaii, Alaska, and Oklahoma, uh, and Oklahoma were added under another law in 1936. Okay, talking about modern tribal governance, um, because there's just the weight of, that, of all of the law um, is just daunting. The governance structure of indigenous nations in the United States is primarily based on a constitutional model that may include aspects of their traditional governing structures. Some indigenous governments organizations are rooted in their treaties. Others are organized under the Indian Reorganization Act or by specific executive orders or specific federal statutes. Still other tribes govern themselves by traditional councils that are organized under their self-determination, not a treaty, not an IRA, the federal or the state uh, authorities. The federal government recognizes 567 tribal governments. My tribe, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, is a federally recognized tribe pursuant to the IRA, the Indian Organization Act. As the U.S. military rounded up the population of the Cherokee Nation for removal in the 1800s to the Indian Territory in Oklahoma, my ancestors hid out in the mountains and after many years began organizing themselves and forming our government. In the meantime, our ancestors were able to obtain and cobble together their deeds, the deeds to the land that they had, and submit them to the federal government, thus creating federal trust lands of 56,000 acres. I don't know how to translate that to hectares or whatever the unit of measurement is. But um, from an estimated beginning of about 1,000 people in 1889, my tribe has a current population of over 16,000 members. We're considered kind of a medium tribe um, because the big tribes are really big <laughs> and the small tribes are really small. Um, so um, our organizing document authorizes a legislative branch or tribal council, an executive branch or principal chief and vice chief. We are elected, um, they are all elected positions of the tribe. Our initial economic resources were based in tourism. We are located at the southern corridor of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, which estimates over 10 million visitors a year. And I'd love for you to come visit us anytime. In 1997, the tribe created a casino enterprise that has become our pri primary economic engine. Our tribal government is the actual government of our towns and communities. We provide the basic needs of our people and then some. Housing, water and sewer and roads infrastructure, health, education, police, fire, emergency medical services, tribal court, prosecutor, jail, human and family services, recreation, and other economic enterprises. The EBCI, or Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, is a founding member of the United South and Eastern Tribes and of the National Congress of American Indians, which is the oldest and largest Indian organization in the United States. This is the piece that I really wanted to talk about, which is national organizing and legislative strategy. Tribal leaders organize themselves nationally and regionally, also on, uh, also on circumstances they hold in common. For an instance, there is a group called the Council of Large Land-Based Tribes, so that those tribes that have large land bases get together and talk about the issues of concern to them. There's the Council on Energy Resource Tribes, people, the tribes that have uh, resources, uh, minerals, and things that they are oil. Uh, that they are uh, managing. The National Indian Gaming Association, which I think is self-explanatory, and then the Intertribal Timber Council, which uh, essentially is a group of, of, of the foresters and the people who are concerned with natural resources. Um, I wanted to just kind of say that when, I, when we were um, uh, organizing to get the Violence Against Women Act passed, um, one of the things that we wanted was jurisdiction. The issue that we had was that um, non-Indians would, we didn't have jurisdiction over non-Indians. Tribes did not have jurisdiction over non-Indians. And when non-Indians would come onto our Indian lands and marry or live with some of our women, sometimes they would beat them up or sexually assault them. And we did not have the ability, because of the way the federal law is written, to redress those perpetrators. And so it took us about 10 years 
but we were able to organize ourselves from the grassroots to be able to push uh, not only uh, to push this legislation through. And how we did that was by uh, organizing ourselves and our allied organizations, our sister organizations um, and brother organizations who shared that same thing, in, that thing in common, the Violence Against Women Act. They knew what we wanted. They, each, uh, each organization has a different piece of something, that, something special that they want. And so we organized with them. The other organizing that we did because it's grassroots was we organized the tribal governments as well. So we created, uh, we asked the National Congress of American Indians, we asked for a resolution to be passed. They passed it, they supported our work, and what they did was they created a task force within that organization so that we could report back to the membership of the tribal leaders. Okay, then what happens is over the, over the years, we just kept doing our work, kept being involved in national legislation, whether it was the Violence Against Women Act or the Family Violence Prevention Services Act. These are all uh, federal laws that pr protect and give services and resources to victims, to crime victims. And then the, what we, came, we wanted jurisdiction to be able to address the perpetrators of domestic violence on our tribal lands. And so we had to change several federal laws that dealt with crime in Indian country and um, essentially uh, dealt with uh, the Tribal Law and Order Act that made those structural changes within the United States Code. And then we were able to uh, push for the uh, limited jurisdiction that we were able to get under the VAWA. Now, that was not all that we wanted, but it was what we could get. And let me tell you, we had one heck of a fight over that. So we lobbied like crazy to get that done. And uh, one of the things that we wound up bumping up against was the racism that was within the Congress and its staffers. We had to essentially uh, just stand our ground. Um, there's a really long story that I'd love to share with you, but I have less than a minute. And, uh, but I just want to say that uh, in the end, we were successful only because, well, before the end, um, Congress is getting ready to go out of session. They, um, they didn't pass the bill. And they came, the congressional members came to the national organizing that we had uh, group and said, we'll pass this law if you get rid of the Indians, the immigrants, and the gays. And they asked them, what do you want to do? And so, of course, they turned to us and we said, look, we don't want to stop you guys from getting the resources that you need for your communities, but if, you, if it's any way possible and if you can, please um, stand with us. And they did, because we had a long-standing relationship with these organizations. We stood with them on a previous issue, and so we asked them to stand with us. They did. Congress, it was a stalemate. They went out of session. And then the first bill that was passed in uh, 2013 was the Violence Against Women Act, and it had all of the provisions in it, and we got our limited jurisdiction. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Next is Elsa Greta Brodestad, the professor at Center for Sami Studies at the University of Norway. Thank you. Good afternoon. First of all, I will pay my respect to the Nanaval and Nambri people and to First Peoples across Australia. Uh, also, thanks to the Australian National University for being invited to attend. I'm honored and grateful for being here. My task is briefly to introduce you to the political strategies in indigenous Sami Norwegian state interactions. I know I should have had the picture of the Sami Parliament, but those of you who have the app can follow uh, the PowerPoint. Uh, the Sami Parliament is the core of the Sami political system and has created a room or maneuver for operationalizing Sami self-determination. Worth emphasizing is that we in general talk about a non-territorial model of indigenous self-determination without the system of reservation reserves or defined territories. But on the other hand, 
a strong emphasis on the traditional Sami settlement area, which constitute 40% of mainland Norway, is at the core of the Sami political project. The Sami have, as indigenous peoples all over, faced a long period of official assimilation where the Sami culture and languages were regarded as backwards and worthless. The policy starting in the mid-19th century lasted for more than 100 years and was inseparable from the emergence of the modern nation state. Such ideas do not necessarily disappear even though public policy changes. But today the nation states recognize some basic principles related to the Sami as an indigenous people. And this change, starting with severe conflicts, followed by new political and legal arrangements, new mechanisms of Sami state interaction, and enhanced institutionalization is my topic here. And the time does not allow me to compare the legal basis, um, status, authority, and mandate of the uh, three Sami parliaments, but it's fair to say that the actual influence of the Norwegian Sami parliament in relation to national uh, political institution is more comprehensive compared to the two Nordic siblings. So I will focus on the Norwegian side of Sapmi. The Samis is the indigenous people of the northern part of Penoscandia and Kula Peninsula. We estimate that we are altogether between 80 and 100,000 and approximately half of us live in Norway. We compose joint cultural and linguistic communities across state borders and these connections are rooted in ancient customs and historic rights, today more or less acknowledged by the nation states. Despite state borders dividing the Sami traditional lands, Sami organizational cooperation has a long history. The more modern history accelerates with the work of the Nordic Sami Council, today the Sami Council, from the mid 50s and onwards. And I also had a nice picture of some uh, young Sami activists. It was a picture from 1974 taken in Port Alberni in Canada where the Sami were part of establishing the World Council of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, among others, Ole Hendrik Maga attended and he later became the first president of the Sami parliament. And this early engagement became crucial for the building of a Sami political agency needed for what was to, was, was to come, and that was the Arta conflict. During the 1970s and the beginning of the 80s, a conflict culminated over the building of a hydroelectric power station on the Arta River in the county of Finnmark, the northernmost in Norway. Demonstrations, civil disobedience, and a hunger strike resulted in a national and international spotlight on Norway's dealing with the Sami. Due to protests spearheaded by the Sami political movement in alliance with the environmental movement, it became impossible to ignore the Sami presence. And what happened uh, paved the way for a new era and the turn of the tide. The power station was built, but it generally held that the Sami lost the battle but won the case. In 1980, in the shadows of the actions, the government appointed a Sami rights committee mandated to detail questions regarding rights of land as well as issues of more political character. The most prominent outcomes resulted in the Sami Act, uh, 87, a constitutional amendment, 88, and the establishment of the Sami parliament in 1989. Adopting the Sami Act in 87, the national parliament recognized that the Sami is a people on their own with a continuous historical connection to the area they live in and shall exist as a people also in the future. And this recognition and commitment was reinforced by King Harald in 1997 when he opened the third Sami parliament acknowledging that the state is founded on the territory of two peoples, the Norwegians and the Samis. And these principles of state policy condition an understanding of the limits of majority rule as applying to state policy towards indigenous peoples as permanent minorities. And this is the point that was addressed earlier today in the first session and also in the hearing. While this was a domestic and legal and political development, it's important to emphasize how international law has framed the policies towards the Samis. Article 27 of the CCPR played a significant role during the Sami institutionalization process in the late 80s, uh, 
in maintaining the state's duty to actively contribute to develop the material basis for this culture. The implication of the Norwegian ratification of ILO 169 in 90, discussed during the 90s, resulted in an emphasis in the 2000s on evolving constitutional practices and currently the right to be consulted is becoming statutory with Article 3 of UNRIF as a core aspect and foundation uh, of interpretation and that's the point I will return to. But one additional comment on the constitutional recognition which was raised as a public claim by Sami organizations in the late 70s. In the in the 1980s, arguments such as being conscious about the past as a condition for the future, the authorities' most solemnly commitment, and a barrier towards policies impairing Sami culture were brought to the table by the Sami Rights Committee. When the National Parliament in 88 adopted the constitutional amendment on the state's responsibility to ensure that the conditions prevail, to enable the Sami people to maintain and develop its language, culture, and way of life, the century-long official assimilation policy with its impacts played a significant role as a moral motivation for those MPs, members of parliament. And also I had a quote here from, a conservative, um, uh, from the Conservative Party referring to the earlier treatments and injustices and the need to restore these. And it should be said that all the political parties from the left to the right adhered to these main principles except from the Progress Party on the far right side. And of course there are political disagreements between the parties on concrete Sami political issues. And also conflicts arise between the Sami parliament and Norwegian authorities, especially with regard to land rights and natural resource extractions as emphasized by the 2016 report of the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. But there is also a cross-party agreement on overall basic principles. In Norway, the Sami parliament has gradually assumed a stronger and more independent position. As a political body, the legitimacy is derived from the Sami people through elections. So every fourth year, the Sami who have registered in, an el in the electoral role based on criteria related to self-identification and Sami language, elect the Sami parliament. An important premise for Sami politics is the framework of the unitary state. However, unitary states also fashion territorial responses and several services of the Sami parliament are significant territorial in their expression and exercise. Like for instance, matters related to language policies, business subsidy schemes and land use planning. A side comment, here is that a side comment here is that the Sami parliament has the authority to object to municipal plans in traditional Sami settlement areas where issues of high relevance for Sami culture are at stake and the municipalities are also responsible to secure an active Sami involvement in planning processes. As pointed out in scholarly work, um, the Sami parliament in Norway has from the start prioritized its relationship with the state. Not with the aim of separating from the state, but to make the state accountable for, for the consequences of its policy regarding the Sami. Uh, and the former president of the Sami parliament, Sven Roald Nystad, said in 2002 the following. When the Sami Digi wants to negotiate with the government authorities over future measures for the Sami, we won't negotiate ourselves out of Norway, but on the contrary, into Norway, into the country's governance so that we can take more responsibility for our own future and future Sami generation. This statement addresses the complex interdependence between Sami and non-Sami policies and interests, also applicable to the development of consultations, which has become a main mechanism of interactions between the Sami parliament and the authorities. In 2005, two years, after two years of consultations, based on the Sami Parliament's claim for consultation in accordance to ILO 169, a clear parliamentary majority adopted the Finnmark Act on the rights to and disposition on land and waters in Finnmark, with support from the Sami Parliament and the Finnmark County Council. Paralleling this, the Sami Parliament and the government entered into a consultation agreement. Consultations should be conducted in good faith 
on both part or on the part of both parties and with an objective of achieving an agreement. But this does not mean that the Sami parliament and the government always agree. Even if the uh, majority of consultations lead to consensus, where they increasingly fail uh, to reach agreement are over issues of resource extractions, energy projects in reindeer husbandry areas. In 2007, the Sami uh, Rights Committee proposed a consultation act. And a few weeks ago, the plenary of the Sami parliament discussed the draft legislation, which is, a, which is a result of consultations and achieved consensus. In debating the new draft legislation, UNRIP is a central to the interpretation of how the right to consultation should be understood and practiced. The Sami parliament amplifies that the Sami have a right to self-determination according to UNRIP and the Article 1 of the Human Rights Convention. The right to self-determination is more than the right to be consulted. Simultaneously, the right to be consulted is a central element in implementing self-determination on areas affecting both Sami and other. It remains to be seen if the bill turns into law, but if it does, not only state agencies, but also municipalities and county municipalities will be obliged to consult. Indigenous lands and waters is a venue for clash between traditional use and large-scale economic development. This is also the case in Sápmi. The conflicts are the same as 30, 40 years ago, and the Sámi parliament faced several obstacles in their efforts of safeguarding land rights and self-determination. There are many setbacks. But the dynamics have changed due to changed political and legal frameworks. In a Sámi Norwegian context, the Sámi parliament has created a room of maneuver for new decision making by dealing with the state, partly as an opponent and partly as a co-player. The consultation uh, agreement presumably turning into law, the Sámi language management area, the Finnmark Act, the right to object in land area planning, all these have been accomplished in dialogue with the, no with the Norwegian authorities, a strategy that the Sami parliament has applied since the very beginning. So the interactions are about coping with conflicts as well as managing cooperation. And a necessary premise for this development that I have outlined here is the autonomous role of the Sami parliament, that they, ha that they are an independent voice, able to shape and make their own policies and integrate this into the political system as a whole. And this is not achieved overnight. As our president of the Sami parliament, Aili Keskitalo, has said, Sami issues evolve in a generational perspective. It can be hard not to, to see the result of one's own work. Finally, let me once more return to the severe conflicts during the Akta era. At that time, Ole Henrik Maga was the leader of the Central Sami Organization, the Norwegian Sami Association. He was in a difficult position, pushed by his own, many who wanted a more confrontational approach. And on the other hand, he had to keep the door open to the government and couldn't lose sight of the political solutions ahead of him. He has uh, said the following about this situation. It is easy to take a shortcut and to get stuck, as I explained, the impatient ones. Yes, those of you working with reindeers, cattle or sheep, if we shall manage to cross that mountain, the easiest way across, try that, but you are not guaranteed to succeed. But if, if we take that longer detour around, the whole herd will safely pass the mountain and we will reach our destination. It doesn't help to get two or three reindeers or sheep across if the rest stays behind. So with those words from Ole Hendrik Maga about the critical time in our history, I conclude my presentation. Olugito. And our final speaker is Matthias Aren, Professor of Law at the Arctic University of Norway.
Uh, thank you very much. I'll be reading from the screen. I'll be preparing this a little bit on the fly. And also, sorry for those uh, that were here this um, lunch session with the, uh, with the briefing of uh, the joint committee. You get, as I attended, uh, if you get some repetitions here. But uh, before uh, getting into um, uh, this presentation, then I would, as others, like to start with uh, ex expressing my gratitude through the traditional custodians and owners of this land and thank them for uh, accepting me as a, their guest here. And I also would like to pay res my respect to the elders, um, past, present, and emerging. And me too, I'd like to thank the ANU for uh, inviting me to share some views and experiences at this uh, very important event. Uh, as uh, mentioned, I'm a professor of law at the Arctic University of Norway in Tromsø. I also come from Urdarke, Sami reindeer herding community in uh, northern Sweden. Uh, and uh, what allows me to be here now is that my, my brother is there now taking care of my few poor reindeer. Uh, I have also, uh, in addition to law, worked relatively extensively uh, in addition to some legal issues, also a bit some political and policy issues. Uh, and I guess it's uh, in, uh, rather in these two capacities, rather than as a lawyer, uh, that I speak here today, um, uh, which is not, not so common and nonetheless, I think, probably to your benefit. Uh, in the outset uh, of this presentation are some experiences, which I hope then will assist the Aboriginal peoples and other Australians in moving forward uh, to establishing the right place for the First Nations in Australia's legal system. Uh, I do um, note and have noted uh, and got that entrenched in the two days I spent here that an underlying factor for the root causes that give rise to this conference is that the Australian Constitution was drafted more than a century ago uh, and at the time uh, then was held that Aboriginal peoples were destined to perish and therefore really needed to be no concern of a constitution. And I, when I heard this, uh, I note that there's a clear parallel here immediately to the Sami experiences because we too, the Sami, were expected to die out uh, about a century ago. Uh, and we were only allowed to pursue our traditional livelihoods such as reindeer herding in the belief that uh, those will soon be extinct. And uh, for example, in a reindeer herding community not that far from my own, uh, when they were pursuing reindeer herding, first uh, there was to be uh, farming uh, to be established in that area, and the, the Sami people were told that farming is the future and you are the past, during the herding is dying out, you're past the past, you might as well quit now. And, but they stayed on. And then com, came uh, forestry. And the forestry corporation said, well, you are the past, uh, you better move, uh, forestry is the future in this area. Uh, there is no uh, forestry there now, the Sami reindeer herders are still pursuing the reindeer herd there. Finally came a mine, and the mining company said the same thing, that you are a part of the past. You might as well move, pack up uh, um, on your own conditions. Uh, the mining is the future here now. There are no more minerals in the area. Uh, the mine is a museum and a UNESCO historic site, and the Sami reindeer herding community is still pursuing reindeer there. There are still some farmers there, but reindeer herding is actually still the dominating uh, livelihood in the area. So they have sustained, or despite all these uh, thoughts and predictions that they will perish. And so have Sami in general. And I think there are similar stories from uh, more or less any other corner of the world where there are indigenous people, and that includes uh, Australia. Clearly, the Aboriginal uh, peoples uh, are here still as well, and very vocal, as I can see. So 
this fact that the, the Nordic countries had to realize that they were wrong, that the Sámi were not going away, and this so-called Sámi situation would not resolve itself on its own behalf, uh, led them to the conclusion that, okay, if they're going to be here, we better deal with this situation. And that has kind of been the starting point on uh, laws developing on how the relationship is going to be between the Nordic countries and the indigenous Sami people. The realization that the so-called Sami situation is not going away, we better deal with it. And I think that is perhaps the initial and one of the perhaps most important observation if comparing the situation between the Sami and the Aboriginal, I think, uh, this very principal uh, fact in the outset that I would hope that Australia uh, would also uh, take lessons from, that uh, this issue is not disappearing, it's not an issue of whether how or if you're going to deal with how you find a place for the Aboriginal peoples in Australia in the legal system of the country. It is when. And since people are clearly suffering this, uh, with this situation being unresolved, uh, I, my suggestion uh, would be that sooner is probably better than later. And that Australia get down uh, to this job now the first lesson learned, so to say, from, from the Nordic context and the Sami experience. And if or when one now um, embarks on this road, um, I have uh, gathered uh, that a principal issue and a principal option on how to, to, to start to address this issue now is to uh, go for some kind of constitutional recognition of uh, Aboriginal peoples here. Uh, and here also we have experience uh, from uh, the Nordic countries and, and the Sami, uh, because, um, oh, I, I should get uh, uh, address those very, very soon, but let me just say on the whole idea of uh, a recognition in the constitution from a legal perspective, I think that makes um, a lot of sense, provided that such a recognition is formulated in a legally relevant manner. Since by far, uh, our constitution by definition is a legal document. Here, here from a legal perspective, uh, if formal recognition is indeed the aim, there is a clear distinction between language that merely, pre merely presents a fact and language that presents a fact with a legal consequence. For instance, a constitutional reaffirmation of the self-evident fact that indigenous peoples such as, for example, the Aboriginal peoples were the first inhabitants of Australia uh, does not necessarily carry any legal consequences. Not necessarily. It's uh, first and foremost a statement of fact. By comparison, in Norway, it's often said, uh, although not in the Constitution, as I will get back to uh, immediately, also by public officials, that Norway is a country founded upon the territory of two peoples, the Norwegian and the Sami. So I think a constitutional provision for you consider, if you want to go down this path, would be uh, as the term people has a clear connotation under international law, and that mainly with regard to the right to self-determination, that you wanted to say something that Australia is a country founded upon the territory of two peoples, the Australian and the Aboriginal. And that would, uh, in that case, have an immediate legal implication. Uh, in, uh, in the Nordic countries, uh, we have not, uh, as indicated, this exact formulation. But the Finnish constitution uh, says that the Sami, as an indigenous people, and then referred to as an opposite, as well as other groups, have the right to maintain and develop the language uh, and their own culture. 
uh, recognition there of the Sami as an indigenous people. In the Swedish constitution, it says the Sami people, and again, distinguishing the Sami from other groups, and ethnic, linguistic, and religious minorities shall have the possibility to maintain and develop their cultural, societal life, and so on. And these two references to peoples and, and uh, indigenous peoples, respectively, would uh, uh, imply, mean, that we're talking about people uh, in, with a right to self-determination with all that implies. Uh, another matter is, of course, uh, whether the, uh, uh, so I have to wrap up, I will do that exactly with uh, the, what I wanted to finalize with the, uh, the how question. Because these are the, um, uh, the constitutional recognition that we have in the Sami areas today. But these came last. The rights that the Sami had achieved and that we are, uh, to the extent we have them, have today, came through court cases, through protest, as uh, Elsie Greta mentioned, and, and then through legislative matters. And these have then subsequently, relatively recently, uh, been uh, confirmed in the Constitution, rather than the other way around. It was not so that uh, the Constitution came first, and then uh, legislation was adopted to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to implement the constitutional provision. The constitutional provision had been um, um, a confirmation uh, to some extent of what is already there. And I think it might be, and you, that, that's of course for you to, co to consider, might be um, a, a challenge to move without having uh, taken some certain steps prior to uh, moving for this, uh, this constitutional recognition immediately, and it was mentioned before, if that uh, was to be defeated, uh, an alternative might be to, to start uh, with uh, legislative matters. That, what I think, would be uh, um, a lesson from uh, the, the, the Nordic experience. Thank you. Yours? Yeah. All right. Thank you, Matthias. Um, we've moved now to some questions. Just briefly to pull a couple of, of the issues I think that we heard uh, raised there together. We heard from Dali and Terry talking about the North American experience, the United States experience, and speaking there about the challenges of sovereignty that pre-exists colonization and how, the, how that sovereignty can be represented within a nation state. And the limitations as well in that, we heard from Dali talking about the problems inherent in federally recognized Indian tribes and how that can lead to its own exclusion. Uh, Terry also talked about the, the limitations of the imposition of American citizenship combined with policies of assimilation. He also, also talked about the long periods of assimilation uh, in the Scandinavian countries and, and the struggle amongst the Sami people there who are rooted in their own customs and language and operate indeed across state borders and how that has led to the establishment of the Sami parliament that, uh, that sits alongside the, the sovereignty of those states within which it operates. And Matthias talking there about that idea of nations being founded on two peoples and the opportunities that may present indeed here in Australia. Um, time is a little bit limited for questions. What I might seek to do is if I could have a show of hands and maybe take questions in a bit of a batch. If I can take three and then we can, we can hear from, uh, from our, our panellists. Anyone? Yeah, Les first. I'll just take your question and then we'll, we'll pick up a couple of others and then uh, get a response. Um, th thank you very much for the speakers and in fact I think my question might be for any one of the speakers or others. Um, it, it's consistently been about the history and the issue of the sovereignty of the state and how Indigenous peoples have been trying to establish the legitimacy of their own sovereignty. Um, but one of the issues that 
keeps coming at me when I'm dealing with um, Indigenous peoples in the Pacific region and so on is about decolonisation. And to me, that suggests really that the state itself has to yield rather than create something um, additional with the Indigenous peoples. And that um, in Australia, I would expect that part of the problem that we have has got to do not just with the parliament, but with the judiciary. Um, and um, I think most people would agree that you know, in stereotype, the judiciary is made up of old white men, but um, in the high court at least. But um, uh, I just wonder if, um, if there's any thought in relation to how states themselves must re-examine themselves and adjust in order for um, the sovereignties to uh, reach a compatible arrangement. I hope that's not too abstract. Thank you. Thanks, Les. Uh, any other questions we can take before I put them to the panel? Yep, one over here. Uh, uh and uh, thank you very much for your time. And uh, uh, I'm just an observer here today, but uh, everyone has mentioned UNDRIP. Article 5 of UNDRIP states that Indigenous peoples have the right to participate in the state if they so choose. Have you chosen to participate in the state? And what would be the outcome if you chose not to participate in the state of Norway, in the state of the United States? Are they not then bound to support your road to self-determination uh, with the foundation of the Grundnorm, your ability to create your own laws uh, under your sovereign authority? Um, that's my question. Thank you. And is there one more before we get an answer? Yeah. I too want to thank the speakers for those presentations. I'd like to ask Daly Sambo Duro, though, if she could just say something of what she sees as the complexities of using the corporate model that emerged under ANCSA as a vehicle for governance and whether or not you feel that's accomplished any of the actual indigenous goals in Alaska as opposed to the goals of the US Congress. Thank you. Um, we'll, we'll start with that, that last question, actually, Dali, if you could um, answer that, the, the, the idea, the complexities of the corporate model. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there are a, a couple of issues related to it. Um, first, how it was all formulated. It, it's obviously different uh, when, for example, in the Inuvialui uh, final agreement uh, of 1984, which was a negotiated agreement that um, they parties, the Crown and the Inuit, had an opportunity to, to flesh out uh, the parameters of the agreement, including a corporate structure. Uh, the, the, the Inuvialui Regional uh, Corporation, essentially. Um, but along with the, the corporate structure that was created there, uh, in addition was a, a significant affirmation of land rights a significant affirmation of the management and co-management rights of the Inuvialui over their resources. Um, also uh, entrenching their traditional economies in terms of their hunting and fishing rights. In contrast, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act purportedly extinguished Aboriginal hunting and fishing rights. And as far as the corporate structure is concerned, um, Tribal governments across the United States, as self-determining sovereign entities, can charter a corporation, can charter an economic development arm. So in the case of ANCSA, it was the creation of corporations and the transfer of uh, title of lands, 44 million acres of our whole territory, to the corporations. If it had been handled in a completely different way, rather than a unilateral act of Congress, I think that it would have been far more acceptable across the board for many Alaska Native people, including the, the tribal governments. In regard to the actual outcomes and, and the prosperity of uh, the corporations, um, so the 12, 13 technically uh, regional corporations that have surface and subsurface rights to lands, um, it has been hit and miss. Uh, 
they, they are all afloat, but um, some have gone through Chapter 11 reorganization uh, and bankruptcy. Um, the, probably the most successful is Arctic Slope Regional Corporation um, and the North Slope of Alaska, which that region originally resisted uh, ANCSA and um, actually right out said no way. Uh, but they are now the, the most uh, <coughs> profitable. They have budgets in the billions of dollars, not in the millions of dollars. They have over 10,000 employees across the globe. That's at one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, there are uh, small village corporations, of which there are approximately 227. Um, the small village corporations that don't have oil and gas, minerals, timber, um, gravel, uh, resources, exploitable resources, or who choose not to exploit the resources because it's in conflict with their traditional economies that are doing very poorly. Some have, um, uh, by virtue of all kinds of shenanigans, actually uh, have led to wiping actual traditional villages off the face of the earth. So that's at the other end of the spectrum. So. It's, it's hard to generalize um, as to uh, its outcome, but for many, um, and I think the, the Northwest um, Alaska Native Association, or NANA, uh, that region has um, enjoyed a very good and constructive arrangement between the regional corporation, the village corporations, the borough government, and the tribal governments. Um, and would probably look at that as as an opportunity for for further study in terms of uh, the outcome er, or the so-called success of economic self-determination that was uh, uh, really within the framework of ANCSA. Yeah, I could say a lot more about it, but I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Dali. Uh, Terry, can I just go to you on that that first question um, that went to the establishment of leg legitimacy of sovereignty and this idea of decolonization and just how much the state has to yield or is prepared to yield. If you could reflect on that with the, the, uh, the United States experience. I know you mentioned that the First Nations people are seen as the first sovereigns of the land and there were treaties at contact uh, that still today shape a lot of that political architecture. But that question of just how much how much room there is for negotiation, that it is not just indigenous people presenting a compromise from their p p position, but just how much room there is or preparedness there is for the nation state itself to yield some of that space. Well, I was gonna say that, uh, Les, that question was very abstract. <laughs> um, but I think that um, with respect to the United States, um, how that uh, might happen um, would be, I think, a, um, the, the country, I think, would have to look at itself. I don't know that uh, there would be political leverage. I don't know how, what kind of political leverage it would take for the indigenous people of the United States to push that question. Um, Dale, you may have a, a response to that that um, is that if you wanted to offer that, but at this time I was, that's, that's where I was, that's where I'm at. I was focused on this gentleman's yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm, go, I'm, I'm going to come to that. Yeah. But w to what extent do treaties themselves, Daly, pr create the opportunity for that leverage mm -hmm. that may ask something of the nation state itself to, to yield what otherwise would be an unlimited sovereignty? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I think that um, uh, if we, if we look at the origin, and I forget now who, who stated it at the outset earlier, earlier today, uh, and maybe it was uh, Patrick that, that did as far as being a treaty, a treaty nation, um, and, and the source of, of international law, uh, and the, the treatment and treating with uh, indigenous peoples. Um, I think that that has extraordinary leverage. We also heard from, um, our uh, Maori relation about how significant uh, the, the treaty actually is. Um, so I think going back to its, its origins, but also the, the legitimacy of them 
in the modern context. And that's what I find so fascinating about the uh, examples in Canada and Section 35, which was uh, raised by um, Brian in his uh, presentation, the, the constitutional protection of the rights affirmed within the treaty. And then you compound that with uh, the recognition of the legitimacy and the uh, vitality of treaties affirmed in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples mm -hmm. in not only preambular language, but also um, in the operative uh, paragraphs, the explicit provisions about the relevance of, of modern day treaties and lending themselves to you know, the, a pathway toward this discussion about decolonization. Um, of which um, I, I would have to think on that one uh, a little bit more as well, because that that entire enterprise um, will import many, many different things, uh, as far as uh, especially as far as the international arena is concerned, and maybe even um, or potentially a, a, a hot uh, buzzword. Um, in in particular political arenas. Mm. And no nation, of course, enjoys an unfettered, unlimited sovereignty because there are international checks and balances and negotiations on that, mm. as China mm. is no doubt um, finding out right now in the South China Sea, for instance, mm. whether or not mm. it, it acknowledges it or not. Um, that, that, that second question on the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, uh, um, Matthias, I'll get a an answer from you on this, and then I'll, I'll come back to you, Terry, on this, because I know you had mm an interest in this question, but this idea of not participating mm. in the state, and would governments then support self-determination? I know, Matthias, there was a, a reference to the period of, of activism and agitation, which led ultimately to the states in Scandinavia having to acknowledge that they need to deal with these issues, that the Sami people were simply not going to die out. But in the absence of participation in the state, what would have happened and was that ever really an option for Sami people anyway? Well, maybe it uh, was at some point, but, uh, but not recently. And the, the way, at this point, as uh, the gentleman uh, making the question uh, referred to the, the provisions in the declaration, it, it uh, basically uh, re reiterates the position of international law, being that indigenous peoples can choose to exercise the right to self-determination through the state democratic system, basically meaning that indigenous individuals uh, uh, participate in that system on equal basis as other citizens through voting and standing for election. But the declaration underlines that is not the primary way that indigenous peoples exercise the right to self-determination. That is only if, as quoted, if they so choose. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they do that through their own political bodies. And those then need, of course, to be established and exist. And that has been the, the, uh, the strategy of the Sami for, for some time, as uh, Elsa Great referred to the Sami parliaments. And this is a right that indigenous peoples have. And if such a body uh, does not exist, as it presently uh, doesn't do here uh, unless you get um, give um, uh, formal recognition to this uh, Congress. Then Australia has an obligation to make sure that such a body is created, mm. because otherwise, and that goes to the question of sovereignty, mm. uh, to recognise the uh, the uh, the right to self determination of Indigenous peoples necessarily implies a transfer of sovereignty or at least the exercise of sovereignty from state institutional body to the indigenous institutional body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, it, it is clearly established by international law that Australia has to support the Aboriginal peoples should they choose not to choose to exercise the right to self-nation in the state institution, but through their own body. Mm -hmm. Australia is under obligation under international law to support mm -hmm. this process. And here one can remind you that the Nordic states are not the only ones that have accepted that indigenous peoples have this right and have then assisted in the formulation, in that case, in the Sami parliaments. These bodies exist mm -hmm. 
in various uh, formations in more or less every country in the Western world mm -hmm. and in the Latin American world with indigenous populations. Australia is really an exception, which has not, which is yet to support the Aboriginal peoples here to have a, a body through which the Aboriginal peoples of Australia can exercise the right to self-determination mm -hmm. through an autonomous way and which is not simply as Australian citizens. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Terry, did you have any thoughts on, on that at all in the, the US context? And yes. This idea, um, and again, I suppose, is it different when you have, even at the point of colonization, you have an acknowledgement of the pre-existing sovereignty of those first peoples? Um, what, what I was thinking was that um, the, the way that the federal recognition process works in the United States, uh, we have sit situations, as Daly had mentioned, where we have state-recognized tribes. And uh, there are also uh, organiz tr tribal organizations that are actually not state-recognized tribes, but that are seeking federal recognition. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's, there's several different kinds of, of those types of entities. I would think that the, um, uh, I would agree with, I think with Matthias on the fact that the, once the, the state has the obligation to um, take a look at that mm -hmm. and um, acknowledge um, if there was an organization, tribal organization that was, I'm saying tribal mm -hmm. in my own reference, um, but if there was an organization that was um, choosing to not uh, participate in the state that um, that they would be that they would uh, organize themselves based on their own sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to say something in in um, uh, in concurrence with uh, what Matthias has referenced here, and, and uh, Hillary Charlesworth um, started a bit of the discussion in her presentation this morning about the the extent to which the government of Australia actively influenced the content of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. They had in excess of 25 years consistently, largely and only because you as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders exist in Australia. They actively participated, uh, they brought lawyers from various different departments uh, to quarterback the diplomats. Um, so they, they heavily influence the, the wording of the UN Declaration. And so Matthias's comment about, about the solemn obligation of the government of Australia, uh, they, these, this can't be taken lightly. And I think that um, not, not only as a matter of customary international law and the right to self-determination as understood in international law, but as a general or conventional uh, principle of international law that the, the government of Australia cannot skirt around this particular issue, that they do have a solemn obligation. They may have um, offered their public pronouncement of support with the UN Declaration uh, with some caveats, with some reservations or understandings or declarations. And as Hillary mentioned this morning, the process by which uh, it becomes effective uh, domestically or at the national level also has to be um, uh, shored up with the fact that human rights are universal and that the idea that, um, okay, well, it's not going to have any operational effect uh, here domestically and nationally, we have to think about not only their solemn obligations um, uh, publicly and internationally after influencing it. I mean, it, this may trigger, in addition, provisions of the Vienna Convention on, on treaties as well, not to undermine the content and the spirit um, of uh, this important international human rights instrument. And I think that this is a, a significant message that not only Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders here uh, need to hear, but indigenous peoples generally, that these are solemn obligations. Otherwise, you know, the, what is the human rights uh, regime about? Um, so I think that what Matthias has hit on is, is re uh, really an important 
element um, to be understood as far as the, the UN declaration is concerned. Oh, so Jeff, a quick comment. We have to move on to the next yeah, session. Yeah, I, I just to want to go back to the, the question about the, the choice to participate with the state. And, and clearly, yes, the Sami parliament has done that, uh, the, done that choice, and, and that has did, uh, happened to different uh, uh, stages. And I mean, they have focused on how to influence the state system, how to educate the system, and mm -hmm. how to make sure that you have the municipalities and the county municipalities on board. So they have become important in implementing the policy of the Sami parliament, mm -hmm. be it language policy, health policy, whatever. It's a, it's a two-way street. Mm. Could you thank mm. our, our panel? Um, we'll go to our, our next session.